right. Great. We've already had a great conversation, but now we're finally recording. So um, really lovely to speak with you again, Alex. And thanks for making time. Um, I've actually spent the last hour looking on the internet a, cu a couple of old talks of yours. And there was one from, I think it was 2013, the TEDx talk, um, where when I watched it, I, I thought you you... It was literally like you were speaking out of my book, Designing Regenerative Cultures. So I, I, for me, this is, is, is almost like a, um, a proof that when you, when you try to serve this regenerative impulse, you actually, we're, we're speaking out of Gaia, we're speaking out of the earth. Um, like so many of the ideas that you were, like I, I hadn't seen this talk when I was writing my book, I saw it today for the first time, but so much is alignment in terms of your vision for over the last um, 25 years with why you even started Guayaki, um, with this impulse of um, we need to give back more than we take, we need to regenerate, we need to go beyond um, just not having a negative impact or a minimal impact, but actually try to have a maximum impact, but on the positive side and, and regenerate things. So I I would love for, for you to tell a little bit of the story, how you, um, like what what made you decide to study food science and, and um, move to California and, and, and how did your childhood in, in Argentina, was it in Argentina and um, Paraguay or? Yes, it was. Yes, it was in both. I mean, back and forth, but um, I always tell the story that, you know, that we all are, you know, the consequence of, of an act of love. So, you know, so it, I, I was conceived in Paraguay. That's what I, you know, my parents have shared that. And, you know, there's definitely then, you know, a, a strong spirit in me of the Guarani culture that, that it's so alive in, in Paraguay. And I love Paraguay. It's just, I feel like um, there's a strong identity. There's a strong part of me that is, comes from there, whatever it's, you know, it's Guarani spirit that it's, you know, in my body now, or who knows. But um, I just also, you know, being brought up in Argentina in in a Scottish school you know that's 182 years old you know it's called saint andrews and it's part of the saint andrews you know school in, in scotland so then i was brought up very british very scottish and um bilingual um with all the traditions and you know that that you know comes with um but i i sort of like always been in contact with nature because my you know my dad is is an agronomist so um, we would just spend a lot of time, you know, weekends, practically every weekend of my life as a child, you know, just visiting farms. And, and um, my dad was an advisor for many, many, many farms. And um, besides having his own uh, family farm, but, um, you know, one of probably, you know, probably it's in, 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 in me that, that smell, you know, that I can recognize of the yerba mate, you know, being, Cevado by, by my mom while my dad was like, you know, driving in the car and, and my mom would pass the gourd, you know, to my dad and my dad would drink the mate and keep driving. And, and there was probably conversations that they were having that I didn't understand as a child, you know, the, the complexity of it. But somewhere I think it stayed, you know, in me as well. Because funny enough, I mean, as an agronomist, my dad always has debated about, you know, the extension of the agricultural frontier on, on forest areas in Paraguay and in Argentina. And, um, you know, and, and the consequences that that creates, not only in the environment, but also uh, for the communities living in those, in those remnants of forests. You know? So, um, you know, I think now I can, I can just identify the whole, you know, thread of, oh, I wonder how I ended up studying food science and looking for, you know, other horizons in California and moving out of Argentina and, um, and just really going to California with, with just probably that vision of, of finding diversity and um, how many people, you know, today refer as 
diversity as being the currency, not only for survival of our species, but I think for, for thriving, you know, you know in, in, in our planet. And I believe in that, you know, and I think I'm just a channel. I wasn't necessarily looking for something specific for that career. Um, I wasn't like searching for, for destiny, but really just being open for destiny to come to me. You know, I always sort of like been driven by passion and by my gut feelings and not so much, you know, using my rational level. That, that sort of like came always afterwards. I say, okay, I feel this. I feel like this is the way to go. Okay, now let's figure it out. Kind of like the vision and mission, how that is defined. The vision being the, the why we do things. Really? And then the, the mission like, okay, now, now let's figure out how we're going to do it. Kind of thing, right? <laughs> so. well, this, is, this was one of the things you said in that talk, which is quite a long time ago now, where you basically said that el para que es fundamental. And the, the, like you have to start with the why, why you do things. And, um, but I also love the way you, you told, tell this story of, of you walking into your classes with your um, thermos can and, and your good and, and people being completely like culturally not used to that and, and thinking you were bringing in something to smoke pot in, in, in class. And, um, but also how it, it allowed you to start conversations because people were kept, kept asking. And, and I think that's, the beauty of, of Yala Mate is, is that it is a really social ritual um, and an invitation to sit together and, and converse and like, I would call it, live the questions together. Um, spend, like build community, build trust, build understanding around um, a ritual that is ancient. Right? Yeah, it is, it is ancient. It comes from the Guaranese, you know, and they, they really, you know, would start the day you know, with this ritual of, of, you know, preparing first the sacred fire. So the fire is really speaking to, to the community. That's why they call it the sacred fire. They usually, you know, would put the wood in a, in with, with facing north, south, east and west, and then heating the water in the fire. And then the water being the female aspect and the board being the male aspect and combining those two. And, um, and allowing each person to drink one gourd in the morning and share their dreams. What, what were their dreams last night? So then the shaman or the head of the, the tribe, the only thing that he would do, he would just interpret the collective dreams. You know, what is the message in that collective dream? And then he would be the one deciding, okay, this is what we should do today or go and farm and uh, to the chakras, you know, what they call the chakras is, is funny enough, chakra, they call it, it's, it's a small piece of plot of, of land, you know, that they slash and burn and, and they, you know, they, with the biochar actually, you know, cultivated that area. And these, these farm areas, chakras is, it's a sacred place for, for the Guarani culture. It's a place where they actually would go and, you know, um, make love, you know, that's, in, in the chakras, right? So, so then for them, it, you know, these decisions um, on a daily basis will, will be made um, by, by, by this daily mantras of, of sharing the board and sharing the dreams, you know, so it's, it's very community oriented. And, um, and then at the end of the day, they would do the same thing and just say, hey, how was the day? How, you know, what did we learn? I mean, from, imagine, from our... imagine, imagine what a ritual like that would do to a community. Imagine how, how much trust, mutual understanding, how, how much conflict avoidance, like, because you, you didn't directly hear where most people are coming from in that day. And, and so it's, it's a bit like I remember at, um, living at Findhorn, every kind of work group was always started with an attunement, which was a sort of very short check-in, but which for a lot of people initially feels like, well, we've got a lot of work to do. Why do we spend half an hour attuning to before we get going? But by doing that, it makes the, the flow afterwards so much more powerful because you, you don't um, run into frictions because you know if somebody had a bad dream or a bad morning um, and, and, and you're much more attuned to the common goal. Um, 
uh, fascinating. Yeah. Yes. All over the world, there have been rituals like that, but we, we, we all now live in kind of nuclear family, or too many of us live in nuclear family situations where that's com completely lost. Yeah, and you know, one more thing that it's, you know, that we started the conversation talking about time. And, um, you know, it's interesting because time is, is, is sort of like, a, it, it, you can bend time. It, we can bend time. We, time is something that it, it's, it's a lineal um, some mindset that we have, you know, sort of inherited. But um, for the Guaranese, um, time can be bended. And how did they bend time? Well, for them, there was no concept of ownership. You know, it was stewardship. Yes. So it, it, was, it was brought by, by the first conquistadores coming you know, to, to the Americas that, you know, oh, this land is mine and, you know, and this is, that they were surprised with this mindset of, of ownership that they, they did not practice. They, in fact, um, did not believe that they owned their own life, right? But that they were not in control of their life. And especially of, of material, you know, um, ownerships of, of, they would burn everything that they would accumulate. And then that was the time to, to move on and migrate. And uh, during, during those migrations, obviously the, the weak or the elders or the sick would die. And in fact, the legend of the Yeromate is about, you know, a young girl, you know, in an act of love, staying with an elder during these migrations. And, um, and, and, and deciding to stay with him. And, and in, as a gift, the, the, the spirit of the Yero Mate plant became human in her and passed on all the knowledge of the plant. You know? This knowledge of, of not only the health benefits, but of, you know, sh of sharing, of you know, listening and, and helping the elders and the weak and the sick and that they're also part of the community. So interesting enough, as they didn't have any belongings, um, they were free of time. They believed that time was only, only being able to be captured once you would you know, stick to a place and, and come with that mindset of ownership. Then you were subject to time. If you did not, embrace you know the belongings then it's you could hop in time with your spirit and you know generation to generations or in rivers or in mountains or in forests interesting no really i mean fascinating <laughs> because i've always for the last 20 years i've always felt that at, at the core of this illusion that is also driving us into believing that we're separate um, is somewhat a misperception of time or it's the other way around that this perception of separateness from um, the flow that actually brings us forth make, makes us feel like there is time. Um, it's it's like, like what Einstein called the illusion of consciousness of, of the separate self. Uh, um, I, I, I sense that so many, like even when you were saying that you you see yourself more like a, a channel, that's a much more flowing image of something flowing through you and manifesting as whatever you do that day. Um, it's, it's very different from thinking of oneself as a being that has to do things in the world. And, um, and I, I think so much of the, the real shift to coming home to place and, and relationship with place and each other is about that that shift of um, yeah, being more aware that that I, like it's it's funny because you're saying they they didn't think that they could control their lives. The the very fact that we think we have much control about anything is 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 actually a huge illusion. Um, and letting go of that makes you so much more creative in in how you respond to what's in front of you rather than what what you think there should be because of the story you've you've been absorbing or told yourself for far too long. Uh, but yeah. but I, yeah. I'd like to 
come back to, to to those early days when was it with David that you got together while still in California and said, why don't we create a mechanism that helps people and planet and do it through running a company together? Yeah, we you know we met in college and and. Um, and, and David was, you know, starting a computer business. I was starting with a, with a yerba mate business. And then he said, I don't want to sell computers. <laughs> this is so much more interesting because it, it, I think he felt the spirit of the plant, you know, and he started drinking, you know, mate. And of course, as an American, he was, he, he was brought up in a culture that did not drink yerba mate mm -hmm. as we do in Argentina, you know, since we're almost like, toddlers <laughs> we're already you know sipping the the bombi and the gourd so david um david was the first one to really you know um see it you know and he understood that that this was an an enterprise you know a, a, a for-profit project you know that would would have uh simply the premises switch so where the goal was to well, we called it at that time, you know, market-driven conservation, right? So it was about conservation, then we, we changed it to restoration, and then now we're talking about regeneration. But at that time in 1986, when we started together, um, we, we really were coming from, from the same paradigm, you know, and, but different cultures. And that diversity really was very powerful. Um, I think that by, by David really understanding his culture, his American, you know, culture, and um, I mean, bringing this element of, of the Yerba Mate culture from Argentina and how we share it and how we create community with our families and friends, you know, and Argentines and South Americans are very, like, friendship and family is first, right? It's, it's that element of, of community. And funny enough, you know, I wonder where it comes from, and we still drink <laughs> tons of mate, you know. But I, for me, the mate was just an extension of my body, and you know, it wasn't until another culture started questioning and and wanting to know more about yerba mate that I, you know, I paid attention to 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 what was this that I was taking for granted in a way, right? And um, and it it allowed me to also strengthen my identity and um and and this is what we continue doing about you know strengthening the identities of every relationship that we build it doesn't matter you know if you are paraguayan brazilian indigenous non-american a student you know in the markets as well um we we you know we we put as the focus the most important focus is in the relationship that we build, you know, between um, human beings, and that gets extended to all the living beings, right? To to flora and fauna, and the air and the and the rainwater, and you know, so from there we can build these these you know communities that thrive in life, and, and that's what we call it. You know, come to life or salua la vida. You know, and, and we focus on these bright spots where, you know, life wants to come back, you know, and so we, we look for those areas where there's maybe higher resilience and, uh, you know, close to national parks or, you know, areas also in, in communities in the United States in markets where people don't want to belong anymore to, to a system that doesn't make any more sense and that, you know, the, the signs are everywhere and you know there's fires in california going there is social injustice there's well you know these are the consequences like you referred to many times you know let's not focus on climate change let's not focus on you know the loss of diversity because these are or or you know fossil fuels the or the, or the cow the, these are real real consequences you know like alan savory many times says don't blame them it's us it's our, you know, it's our holistic management. It's our perception of life that needs to be changed. Our mindsets that need to be changed. 
This is it's fascinating because a while ago I had this conversation with one of the, the great gurus of the sustainability consultancy world, um, John Elkinton, who, who um, set up the environmental data service in the late 80s and then set up sustainability um, and, and was the inventor of the triple bottom line. And then um, he um, later created Volans, which he, which he now works with. Um, and um, he's re recently written a book called Green Swans. And this, this idea of a green swan um, is really quite a powerful one of, of like picking up on the black swan idea of events that, that happen and then continuously make, make things go worse, like a sort of exponential um, path towards collapse and oblivion. And th the idea of this green swan is creating interventions that are actually um, increasing like that are salutogenic, that are increasing health, that are increasing abundance, that are, that, that are getting better and better. Um, and it feels like so much what the, the outset of how Guayaquil has worked in, in um, Argentina, Paraguay, and, and Brazil with local communities. Like in, in one of the videos, which is I think seven years ago, you, you speak about a vision 2020, and it's kind of interesting because we're talking in 2020. Um, it was back then you said we want to reforest 200,000 acres of rainforest um, through shade grown yerba mate, but in combination with working with indigenous communities and actually enable them to protect their forest and have a livelihood. So the, the second, the social side of that regenerative mission was um, giving a livelihood through that work to a thousand families. How, how close did you get to, to that mission? Well, you know, we surpassed that mission already. Um, you know, we're over 2,000 families. Um, we're, we're working with over 200,000 acres. And at that time, you know, we, we were just, you know, using some indicators and you know, having dashboards and, you know, measuring on the impact, which is, is it, it is important to do, right? And, um, but um, now things have also changed because, um, now there is, you, you can't do it anymore by yourself, you know, and, and when we started with this mission, we were like, okay, we're going to do this working with, you know, our farm suppliers and indigenous communities. But during these 10 years, what has changed is that now we have a lot more, many more partners. You know, we have national parks, we have, um, biosphere reserves, you know, declared by the United Nations, you know, from in, in, in Paraguay, the Mbaracaju Reserve, for example. So, you know, NGOs, you know, the, the Guida Foundation, which is, you know, an extension of bird life in, in Paraguay with the San Rafael National Park, you know, they, they are also partnering with us in, in these last five years because they, they also figured out that the model of conservation is just like putting a fence around, you know, a national park or, or private biosphere, you know, United Nations Reserve was, was not enough. You know, you have to work with all the social actors, with all the stakeholders living in the buffer zones of these protected areas, because otherwise, you know, it's impossible to protect. Um, and, and, and the same thing happens in Africa. It's, it's, highly expensive to put these high huge electric fences to 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 you know to protect the elephants and the lions which are you know the most um dangerous species that if they go outside these electric fences they will destroy crops and, and communities right so they have these problems that well we can't have these enormous extensions with electric fences, it's just ridiculous, you know? It doesn't make any sense, but they figured it out, like Pinda in South Africa, figured it out that they needed to work with the communities too, and, and start working with the, with the Zulu communities. And they became, you know, the stewardships of, those, of these private reserves of these national parks. And that's the same thing we started doing. So that's why we're, we have now, you know, expanded this, this mission, of 200,000 acres and, and 1,000 families, and we have surpassed that. And now we're even working with the Amazon ecosystem and, and also paying for the service 
that the Amazon ecosystem is generating through the sky rivers. Before, and, you know, before we get to that story, like I, I want to ask you about that because we, we had a little bit of um, collaboration in the conversations with Martin Hildebrandt around that project, but briefly back to this working with the communities. Um, the, are you aware that there's a big project around the Masai Mara game reserve in Kenya that, that um, is basically, the, it, it's a model which is called land conservancies where um, you, you work with the local people and actually pay them to help conserve the land through more regenerative farming. Um, have, you, have you looked into that model? Yes. Yeah. yeah, and and I think you know that is that is stewardship. That's the concept of stewardship, really. And uh, by bringing in the local communities and bringing in also, you know, the the government institutions, the private initiatives you know, that that are for profit as well. You know, there's 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 so it's so much easier to work in collaboration. You know and and not trying to be a Don Quixote mm -hmm. and fight, you know, against the windmills and, and you do everything, right, kind of thing, right? It's, it, th that's an old paradigm. We, we cannot continue, you know, striving for our egos and to, you know, I'm the successful multi-million Jeff, Jeff Bezos, you know, or, or I, Elon Musk, you know, what does that mean? Really, I mean, what's behind them? You know, hundreds of people working for yeah. them to become the, you know, the successful millionaires, you know, but it, it's not really them. It's, it, it's not only them, it's them, but it's also, you know, resources, communities, employees, you know, um, public services that are allowing that to happen, you know, consumers, right? All of us who buy through Amazon, you know, are part of that successful story as well. So I think that, you know, the paradigm of just one individual, one organization, you know, having a mission, it's, it's, it's old already, you know, and that's what it allowed, it has allowed, I believe, Guayaki as a business to be successful in these last 25, we're going to be 25 years next year. You set out, I, lo I love that line um, that you ended that TED talk so long ago with, um, no se trata de crear um, la mejor empresa del mundo, se trata de crear una mejor la mejor empresa para el mundo. Um, so it's, it's, it's not about creating the best company in, in the world, but it's about creating the best company for the world. And, and you, you can only do that if you do that with other companies together. And even like now seeing in the, in the post, like the kind of pandemic world, how you were saying earlier before we started recording, that everything is going fine because you have strong teams in every place and and you are decentralized like you 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 kind of more more in control of your whole supply chain because you actually build collaborations along the entire supply chain which which are much more resilient than if it's just a um like you have team there so it's not not an entire economic transaction it's it's part of the, the the, the family that, that makes Guayaki happen. Um, yeah, it's a shared mission. Yeah. It becomes a shared mission. So, you know, that's why we have, I think, higher resilience in, in these types of crises. Um, and, and then at the same time, it's not that we control anything. It's we, we, in Guayaki, I would say that we work, it's, it's kind of a pathway that we are, you know, in going towards uncertainty, really, and we, you know, uncertainty is not something that we are afraid of, yeah. but something that we find that it's in those areas where things are not controlled that the answers, you know, to the questions that we we all, you know, developing mm -hmm. as 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 society, we we can find them there, you know, in uncertainty precisely. Yeah. This is strongly related to, like, I find that one of the most fascinating aspects of your new collaboration with Gaia Amazonas and, and the Sky Rivers, what, what you, that you were mentioning earlier too, is, is that you're not, like the conventional pathway right now for companies who want to show that they um, 
want to have a positive impact is to, in a sort of linear way, have it all measured and demonstrate their positive impact. What, 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 you, what you're doing with supporting an organization that is helping how many, 30 indigenous tribes in an area of 500,000 hectares of Colombian rainforest um, to steward, to continue to be the stewards of their ancestral lands and help them to have sovereignty, sovereignty and, and, and in their relationship with the national government, su support them so they can basically manage their own lands in the way that they see fit. That's so much more of an indirect way that you will never be able to get all the detailed figures of where every dollar that you spent on supporting this process has actually gone. But, but by, by supporting these people to protect that land, you're protecting the forest that creates the rain that waters the Bosque Atlantico and basically um, waters the Habermate plantations of the, the tribes that you work with in, in the in Bosque Atlantico. Um, but it, it's really demonstrating a, a level of systemic thinking, of understanding the Gaian patterns, the, the sky rivers, um, that I haven't seen in, in many companies. Um, wh when did you start with that vision of, of um, working in that way? I think from, from the start, really, I mean, from 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 the initial DNA of of Guayaki, you know, it was like you know, driven by 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 the gut feeling, driven by you know, well, and the gut, you know, mm -hmm. that's a big <laughs> that's a big part of our body that you know keeps our immune system too, you know. But that's another subject. But but I think that if if we listen to our um, internal call, you know, or internal voice that we all have in common, these, this little voice that speaks to us. And, and then, you know, which, that's the why, that's, the, that's our vision, right? Of, of okay, this is the why am I gonna put things into action? Then it's the mission, it's how I'm gonna do it, right? How am I gonna, you know, accomplish or manifest my dream, right? And then you have a set of values that, that you say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do a certain things because you have values, right? And um, I think that you know, for it, it was embedded in 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 the genesis of Waiyaki, you know, and and I believe that it's due to the spirit of the plant, you know, and, and what the plant comes to to in a way, you know, humanize. And, and put into action if we are open to it. So it's not really like looking for destiny, but allowing being open to destiny to come to you. you know, it's sort of like switching the mindsets all the time. And um, it's interesting enough then, Guayaki, why did we choose that name that's so hard to pronounce? And what does it mean, Guayaki? You know, it's the name of a, an indigenous tribe in Parawa, you know, hunters and, and nomads that lived in the forest until the 1970s. And, um, and at, at the same time, it's difficult to pronounce. So with David, we, we sort of like, why a key? Imagine a door and why do you need a key? <laughs> why a key? So, and in a way, and in a way, this is what we do. You know, it's, it's, it sounds very hippie and sounds very, you know, maybe very artistic, but it's, it's we, I think why a key is an opportunity for for everyone that's part of Waiyaki to open doors of perception, right? To just discover that there's so many doors that we can open and they're all there and we're free to open them or not. But the only reason why we don't is because there's uncertainty what's behind the door. And we're, we're afraid many times to open them. But once you open them, it's just wonderful. Like love, it comes with pain, and it comes with suffering, and it comes with everything. You know, it's not like it's only all happiness and joy all the time. You know, it's the yin and yangs, and we have to allow ourselves to enter into that universal perception of life, 
that there is always this yin and yangs and, um, and not be afraid. So Guayaki is discovering all the time new doors of perception. And the one of the water was recently, you know, in the sky rivers. And it just, it was actually in 2018 that I was in Costa Rica and, you know, and I saw my daughter and this other kid playing in the water. And I go, oh my God, with all the metrics that we have, as a B Corp, you know, and with objectives and purpose and everything that then get sort of with our aspirations and dreams measured by all these indicators. And we have our annual impact reports that we, you know, are measuring all the aluminum and packaging and, you know, emissions and trying to reduce them and trying to regenerate more life. Um, we all of a sudden we realized that we were not measuring the water. So it was like, oh my God, you know, but it's, it's all, all the time, you know, it's okay. You know, there's more going to come. There's, there's more things that, you know, that we don't know that we're doing, that we might be doing wrong or we're not measuring yet that we will, we will measure. And this is an opportunity as a, as a business to do it. And, um, and I think that with the sky rivers in the Amazon, we realized that, you know, the, the Atlantic forest or Silva Misionera that we work in where the yerba mate is native to, and it grows in the shade very well, because it's in a, a species, a tree species that grows, as you see in, in, in these back images here, it grows in the forest. Well, that ecosystem depends on another ecosystem. What do you mean? It depends on, yeah, it depends on another ecosystem. It depends on the Amazon forest because of the rainwater that the Amazon produces, 1,000 liters per tree, according to Carlos Nobre and the scientists measuring this for the last 50 years, it's 1,000 liters that each tree produces per day. And there's probably 2,000 trees per hectare, more or less, right? So imagine the amount of water that these trees through the root system that's just sucking all this water and through the transit evaporation during the day when it's, there is photosynthesis occurring, it's just creating all this water vapor that then gets you know, condensated as it reaches a certain altitude creates a vacuum that allows for the winds from the Atlantic to, you know, come in, you know, be the Aliso's winds that actually are generated from the Sahara Desert and all these particles of phosphorus and everything feeds into the Amazon as well. But this system, this biotic, what they call the biotic pump, right? And that you can see clearly in a satellite image, it's fascinating, it's, and I didn't know about it until 2018 when these two kids were playing in the water, right? And I said, this is a new generation saying, pay attention to it. At least that's how I see it. It's, it's the next generation is saying, pay attention to the water because we're gonna need that. And that kid playing with my daughter was Martin's grandson. Ah, okay. So the connection is good. Lovely. No, because yeah, see, and, and again, it's it's allowing serendipity and life through serendipity to play its its meaningful role. Like the, those two, like finding the meaning in the, those two. Because I mean, Mart Martin is um, a remarkable man, and what he's already achieved. Um, I mean, uh, right livelihood award winner for his work on on protecting the largest area of Amazon rainforest um, in in Colombia. Uh, um, so, but but what is it exactly that that this project is supporting now? That the, the partnership between um, Guayaquil and um, Gaia yeah. Amazon is supporting. So it's you know we, we're paying annual fees to Gaia Amazonas, which is the foundation that Martin started forty years ago, and you know um, it's paying for the leadership program of young you know indigenous girls and, and, and boys 
that are going to be the stewards of these lands. You know? And we're talking about a huge amount of, you know, the size of France, right? And we're, I mean, we're 25 million hectares. I mean, it's, it's huge, right? It's, it's an area that, that it, was, it was all public land until uh, Martin helped through the Colombian Congress to, to make it indigenous lands and also on top of that, put, you know, protect the, all the natural resources below the, the, the soil and, and created national parks, right? That are managed and stewarded by the indigenous knowledge. So is it that, because that was one of my, my worries um, with regard to, in so many countries, you can be given land ownership, but you're not allowed, you don't have the ownership for what's underneath the land. And then it's always the back door for the national government to be able to um, relocate people and, and disown people because they say, well, we've discovered a mine underneath your land and that's national um, jurisdiction. So, so, so Martin actually protected, helped to protect that as well. Exactly, by the developing uh, you know, all these lands as national parks. And if you think about it, the Amazon is a garden Created that's been yeah. really uh, managed by the indigenous knowledge, you know, of slash and burn and moving on and the terra peta, and it's it's really a garden, you know. So recovering that knowledge and empowering that identity of these communities, it's it's not only a benefit for the for them. But it's a benefit for all of us and for future generations as well, right? The yeah. Amazon, it's a key ecosystem that the entire planet needs, you know? And millions of people depend on, and, and businesses too, and in, particularly in, in, in the south of the Amazon and, and the whole um, Plata uh, Basin, you know? Rio de la Plata, the River Plate Basin, depends over 50%, you know, of, of this rainwater. And, um, and we're already seeing the, the, the rain, it's, it's diminishing, the, the rainfall is, is going down because the Amazon forest is, is being burnt down. So it's good. The, the consequences are gonna be disastrous from many perspectives, from ecosystems, economy, social, you know, justice um, so it, it doesn't really make any sense for us to to burn these ecosystems but on the contrary what Waiki is doing is that it's internalizing this externality of the water and really just making it you know sort of like hey you know we're doing it let's let's all do it you know because it's not only Waiki that's going to save the the Amazon rainforest or the Atlantic forest we well, all need Part of it, you know. it's, it's, it's giving an example of that kind of um, systemic reciprocity. It's even more than reciprocity because it's like, of course, you get the water, but you're supporting a process that is much more diffusely salutogenic, health generating in the, in the region on so many levels. It's, it's all those tribes have a benefit from owning their land and having sovereignty and, and, and then you get the water as, but, but also I, I love the way that you brought in the Sahara because that, that's also like, if you spin that cycle even further, then so much of the fertility of the Amazon is partially the careful management of, of the indigenous people living, living there um, over, over millennia, but also um, the, the bigger wind patterns that, that bring, um, the nutrients from the Sahara. Um, and so even further upstream of your plantations of, of Hierba Mate um, in, in the Mata Atlantica is also the, the whole Sahara Desert and the winds that cross the Sahara Desert. So there's, the, the, there's even a, a possibility to link into the um, Great Wall of Africa project, the reforestation around the, the southern um, part of the Sahara Desert because that also helps to maintain the health of those circulatory patterns um, as, we, as we spin around the globe. Uh, it, it's, it's so yeah. important to think yeah, of it systemically. You bring up Africa, 
Africa, you know, and you know this this interdependency, you know, it, it goes Daniel in so many levels, right? Because, um, like I, like I shared, you know, we started with the market driven conservation concept, right? And then we went to the market driven restoration, and now we're talking about the market driven regeneration, you know, and where we hold that the regeneration, we love your definition of regeneration, you know, this capacity of change and to, to maintain life systems. And as, as we go into, into learning more about regeneration, we find that the real regenerators in the forest are the flora and fauna, are the, the, the biggest, the, the mammals, the, the trees that, you know, these are the real regenerators. And so, so some, some, you know, some are calling it rewilding and, you know, bringing, you know, back the species that have been extinct and sort of like the, the, the wolf in Yellowstone, right? And that has, through the cascading effect of the trophic effect, has regenerated all the, the ecosystem back in, in Yellowstone, how, you know, and, uh, and balanced it, right? And so this, this is something that's being done in, in Argentina through the Tompkins Foundation, and um, now it's called Rewilding Argentina. And, um, and they're reintroducing, you know, species like the jawer and the anteaters to balance, again, you know, the, the ecosystems that have now been donated as national parks. But interesting enough, when I ask uh, Doug Tompkins before he died, and I know Chris Tompkins very, very well, for me, they're, you know, I look upon them as, as real teachers. Um, it, they said, well, we learned this from, from Africa. I said, what do you, what do you mean? Well, yeah, we, you know, there's, there's a place called Pinda in, in the north of South Africa. And, and they've, that, is, that was an area that was, you know, all with, with the colonialism, it was all, you know, all the wildlife was gone. And there was plantations of pineapple and, you know, and cattle and fences everywhere and, and eucalyptus plantations. And many years ago, um, a group called Pinda bought that land and reintroduced the, the, the wildlife, reintroduced the elephants, the, the, you know, the big farm, you know, the largest farmers, you know, in, in Africa, reintroduced the lions, started reintroducing and, and developed this business, you know, th that, is, that is for tourism to, to go and do, you know, watch safari and watch all this wildlife. And, and I was inspired by them through this rewilding process because they generated through tourism, you know, um, income, and they also were able to work with the uh, Zulu communities living around these areas that were very, very poor at that time. And now they're part of their stewards. They're, they're the park rangers. They're, they're the ones running the, the business, you know? So I went to Pinda last year and I, went, I, said, I said, I have to go and visit this place. And I went there with my son who was something of 15 years old. And, and I said, okay, let's go to a trip. Let's go to Africa. He was, fascinated I said well let's go and let's go and, and learn from this experience here and I went to Pinda and, and I was sitting down there talking with the park rangers the, the Sulu park rangers native from from that land and I said to them do you do you ever have you ever heard about Tompkins they said no we have no idea well do you know that he was inspired by the work that you've done here he took this inspiration the purpose of what you've done here locally with great success, right? And reach out back all the life here. Yeah? Well, somebody else saw what you've done here and took it across the Atlantic Ocean, just like the sun dust from the Sahara, took it to the Atlantic, over the Atlantic to South America and has regenerated millions of hectares into national parks and rewild this area and bring tourism and bring you know, community development to all this area, thanks to what you've done here. Yeah. So here's the. How did they respond? How did they respond? How did they? How did they, they, they? They were surprised, and they 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 couldn't believe that what they've that the purpose of their work on a daily basis on a local level has an impact on a regional level and on a global. Level. See, this this is this is fascinating. We all need to understand. Exactly. This is so, such a good example of 
that the only like Bill, Bill Reed from Regenesis Group, one of the, the kind of gospel holders of, of truly regenerative works, so to speak, is um, he always says that, and now I've lost my train. Um, I am I'm talking about place. Like he, he said to me once, we can't heal the world. We can't save the world, but we can save places. But because places, are always fractal. They're always that local place, that local community, that specific ecosystem, but they're also the, the earth, they're everything. And so the only way to get anywhere close to healing the earth and through that also healing her people is to engage people in healing place, um, lo local place. And, and then the ripple effects can be so much higher than, than you could ever imagine because these, these people probably were proud to be part of a project that over 30 years did that amazing work in um, South Africa, but hadn't been made aware of the fact that that also spun off a project that is, is, is vastly larger um, in South America. It's, it's just a beautiful example of, of we all just need to do our bit and, and that then inspires others. Yeah, we're connected. We're, we're you know, in every, it's the butterfly effect, right? It's it, it it does have an impact wherever you do, you know, in any part of the world. So that's why it's really important to strengthen the identity, you know, because it, it is, you know, each individual, each human being is so powerful, and I know there is a certain, you know. Um, you know, negativity about we humans, you were destroying everything, and we humans are seven billion, and it's a population, you know, crisis, and you know, are we the, the cause of all the problems, right? Why? 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 Why are we the cause of all the problems? It, 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 you only think that if you see that it's because of this feeling separate from the world. We're actually part of the world. And we, for millennia, have been careful custodians, more than even stewards, custodians of eco, um, ecosystems that, that have um, helped to bring them to life and helped to um, increase diversity. And, and, and we're, we're seed spreaders as a species. We've, we've, we've um, helped plants move into places that they couldn't have helped, uh, moved without us when we were still migratory. And I, I'm convinced that we can and we were still demonstrating in so many places around the world that we can have a healing impact on ecosystems. Um, we were talking before we started recording on all these wonderful examples around the world where, where things are coming back and they're coming back because people in that place are starting to love and care and, and um, have a healing influence on, on, on the local ecosystem. Yes, and, and exactly. And, and there is a lot of, you know, resilience in, in, in many communities around the planet that have been able to, you know, live with, with nature in, in, you know, we're talking about 2 million, you know, what they call the, the Martin, the anthropologist from Colombia, Martin von Hildebrand speaks about, you know, 2 million indigenous communities, not 2 million in population, I, I don't know how many communities, but living, in the Amazon before um, the Spaniards arrive and the Portuguese. Mm -hmm. Managing this ecosystem. It's not like they were, you know, just living out of, of nature. They were actually farming, hunting in specific moons, in specific with a monastery discipline. It's not like, okay, now I feel like eating or a fruit and I go and just grab it. No. No, no, but totally tuned with nature, and they were able to speak with the plants and with the stars and with the earth. And that is a knowledge that I think you know we need to recover. We, as a society, you know, and um, I think it was Wade Davis, the famous anthropologist too, from from ethnobotanist from from BC, um, in in the in the Trail of the Anaconda, which is the movie that they made about 
Martin's life and, 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 and Wade Davis' life and working with indigenous communities in the Amazon. And he, he referenced it as, as well, if, if we are taught in, as in a young age that uh, mountains and rivers are resources that we can use to exploit, um, well, then we, we're not going to care about doing that. But if we are taught that these mountains and these rivers are sacred, we're not going to just, you know, mine them and, and contaminate them with, you know, with mercury and cyanide, you know, to extract the new gold out of it because they're, they're sacred. They're, we are nature. We are the river. This, this is one, one of the things that when we, when we spoke with Martin about the project um, a few months ago, um, the way he was describing how every ritual, every song, every dance is a way of cultural transmission from one generation to the next to understand um, the patterns of the forest and how to not, not only interact with it in terms of as an other, but, but actually the way I heard him describe the relationship with the forest is really being expressions of the forest being like the, the 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 tribes are fitting into the patterns of the larger whole that brought them forth and they they're expressing their uniqueness by being in co-evolving mutuality or healing support of the larger whole that actually enables them and that that's at the core of of regenerative practice how do we um express our identity and our essence of, of unique contribution to life as life in the wider context by serving, by giving more to the larger context than we are taking from it. And, and it's actually in that process that we express our unique gift the, in, in, in the best way. Um, and that's the sort of re-indigenization process I think we all need to go through around the world now of of coming home to place as communities of, of I, I don't think this is just the, the realm of um, the remnant um, indigenous nations that are still around the world, but, but it's actually the, the job of all of us because all of us are indigenous to, to planet Earth. You, I mean, the way you speak, um, the relationship you have with, with, with um, Yerba Mate is as you were speaking earlier a couple of times, it reminded me of um, when when Paul Stamet speaks about mushrooms. Um, mm -hmm. it, it literally had, had that sense of, it's the mushrooms talking in the form of a human being. Like the, and and I, I mean that as a great compliment. Um, it's, yeah. And I think that's what we all need to learn to speak, let, let the the wider whole that we are speak through us again. And, and, and that's the big lesson from indigenous people. That's why they managed to live within bioregional um, boundaries in ways that, that actually generated shared abundance for, for millennia. Yes, yes. And, and yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I was just thinking about um, you know, a, a project in, in Peru that was trying to clone some jaguars, you know, and, and so in order to, to make this process a little bit, you know, more, um, more down to earth, if you want, um, they, they called in one, one of the indigenous shamans from, from a local tribe, you know, and, uh, and he said, <laughs> if the jaguar is going to disappear, it's because he he wants to disappear. There is no way you're going to you're going to avoid you know that from occurring, you know. So the cards are like the cards are already played, and it and it's it goes beyond what we can do and what we can, you know. And and I mean I think. The message there to me is that if we tap into the knowledge that nature has, you know, glaciers, mountains, trees that have, you know, they're, they're passing 
knowledge millions of years old and we tap into that then it's you know we're not gonna we're not gonna destroy ourselves you know we're gonna all of a sudden tap into the knowledge the universal knowledge of life yes and we will find our role and function as another species in in this mother earthship that is not only a closed sphere but that is also influenced by the planets and the universe and everything we, we, we started supporting you know we've always supported pioneers and i know you're you're very close to nina simmons too and this is one of the elements that we also believe that we want to support you know and um that that there's other forces also that we need to pay attention that are beyond the earth our close sphere of life there there is other life yeah. even outside our sphere no absolutely there's a real danger of um becoming a kind of gaian reductionist and and being so gaia centric that you don't understand how gaia sits in a larger um cosmic context and is is just one expression of probably a huge diversity of, of of life exploring other journeys in other places it's just it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to to think of the universe as only having life on planet earth and actually once once we get into the whole conversation around what is life um, and what is matter and that whole separation of dead matter and living bodies is 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 much more um participatory rather than separate than than um modern science in the traditional sense has has made us believe but even now modern science is starting to understand that um we might have got it wrong that maybe consciousness is primary and matter is secondary and and that really is what also a lot of the indigenous wisdom keepers are, are holding this this connection to as you were speaking learn, learning not just from nature but as nature where mountains aren't just sacred and the rivers aren't just sacred they're ancestors they're part of our lineage and when once we once we connect into that lineage we're not so speciesist anymore we're not that trapped in our individual or our human identity to the point that we that that aligning with that impulse of life that is also if we humans need to disappear we will disappear um but but that's not the end of the story and it's not the end of our identity because we have a dual identity we're life and we're human human um and and hope hopefully i mean you and i i think both share the belief that that we still have a role as human beings to to address some of the damage that we've done over the last few thousand years um and to fully reach our potential of of being exactly what what you were alluding to just now the the local expression of of that capable to receive the connection to life in other places around the planet to even have that that the the mental frames to explore our beyond planet connection to to a living cosmos um that's that's one of the reasons why i think that we're, we're still worth um calling for as human beings otherwise it, it would be too easy to say we're we're only making things worse we're not um there's so much we we can do can you hold on at just a minute sure. yeah Okay, come back, Sam. Excellent. Right. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation so far. Um, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> we always have a, have a way of finding thank very you, well. thank you. Um, I, feel, I feel like I'm one of those Elon Musk rockets that just went out to space and now we're back. And <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we have I've just landed again. Um, the, the, there was one thing that, actually two things that, that I wanted to um the mention in this conversation one of them um is about your work as a 
food scientist when you were studying food science like the, the yerba mate as a, as, a, as a plant has a hundred and what was it 96 active ingredients um, have you have you done a lot of research into kind of medicinal and health properties and and, and all that as well um, and and also I'm, I'm curious about the whole what you actually bring together in the in the product like there's there's the the um yerba mate but but yet also all sorts of other spices and that each one of those spice probably has another whole storyline of connection to community where it's produced and all that and and have you started to ex explore all those kind of mycelial yes patterns of of your company yeah yeah, I, I love how you refer it to the mycelium and um, concept because, you know, that's, I, I truly believe in that. And um, I remember meeting Paul Stamets in, in, um, in, in Sweden ten, 10 years ago. I met also um, at that time, John Liu and, and Martin, you know, we were all met at that time back in Sweden in one of these Talberg Foundation gatherings. And, and it, you know, as we get into, you know, even like Zach Bush talks about, you know, how uh, each cell has maybe between 800 and 3000 mitochondria, you know, that are in constant communication among each other and with the cell. And then as well, each cell with, with each organ and each body. And, and, and so we do the same thing as, as, you know, as a business, as a, you know, as we also look at it as a living entity. And um, I'm not only looking at the yerba mate, which is the main ingredient and the beverages that we make, but all the ingredients that go together with it. Um, sugar, you know, working together with, you know, a regenerative project in Brazil of organic fair trade sugar and, and um, paying attention there, paying attention with, with um, the extract of yerba mate that it's, it's done in, in Brazil. And now that company is, is becoming a B Corp um, so we, we're seeing, you know, that an emergence of, of consciousness and or, or purpose all along our supply chain and around the life cycle of the product. And um, I think one of the differences that people feel when they drink the mate in a can, even, even if it's not in the traditional way, which, you know, you have all the stems and leaves of the plant in here with the 196 active ingredients, like you said. I actually say the 197, we're, we're, the, the, yeah, right, we're the other ingredient. Um, it's when, 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 you, when you look at the plant, at the Yerba plant, it, and its environment where it grows naturally, it's in the forest, you know? And it's considered a sacred plant, it's considered a mother plant, because one of those plants that has sort of the, so many active ingredients. Most plants have 20, 40 active ingredients. There's few plants that have, you know, 200 or above 200, like the coca leaf or the yerba mate or marijuana. And, you know, there, these particular plants have so many active ingredients because they, they, they are a representation of their ecosystem as well, right? And the yerba mate, I think when, when we produce the yerba mate drinks, we, we create an infusion. We put infusion like you would put the, you know, like you would do it at home with hot water and you just put all the herbs in there and we create an infusion and we heat it up. And that's what we pour into our drinks together with some of the yerba mate extract as well. Um, and, this, and ginger and grapefruit and they all come from sources that are fair trade. 100% of our sources are fair trade and organic, right? Um, and we recently have also sort of like gone down the, the path of, well, if there, is a, if there is a regenerative certification and there is a movement to do it, and well, let's be part of that rock certification. So we were part of that initial pilot project that certified, you know, regenerative products called rock right now, tell me a, tell me a bit more about that like, because I, I i know that there, there's a new regenerative agricultural standard that that has been developed and i think you were also somehow 
involved in that team. Is that right? We were involved together with, you know, with Patagonia, Dr. Bronner, just to mention a few. But um, to, to develop this, this certification that, that goes beyond organic, right? That, that is trying to, to regenerate also, you know, the, the life back into the soil and not just sustain it, right? Um, but to increase it. And it's not difficult to do. It's, it's something that is completely possible, changing in our practices and you know, our, you know, going back to Alan Savory, how do we holistic manage, you know, don't, don't blame the resource, don't blame the cow, don't blame fossil fuel. It's, that's not, you know, the, why we have climate change here. The reason why we have it is because of how we manage, right, these life supporting systems. So Rock is putting attention to that, is looking at the farm as a living system and not as a resource that you can farm without any agrochemicals, right? But that you can actually regenerate that ecosystem back to, to its life with the microceliums and um, the life below the soil above the soil into relationships and interdependencies that exist among not only the crop that you're actually farming but the crop depends of, of all that ecosystem it depends on the birds it depends on those seeds that the birds bring and that you know bring trees and that at the same time are retaining the right amount of shade and humidity that that soil needs and that all those microorganisms need to sustain and regenerate life. And there's more birds that come and there's then the tapirs and then the jaguars that eat the tapirs that also need to be there because otherwise the tapirs would just eat everything. So it's that looking at, at what you're farming as a living entity is the key. You know, and, and when we go back to, to the yerba mate, we put it in a beverage. This yerba mate has, it's grown in the rainforest. So you're not only drinking the yerba mate, you're drinking the yerba mate plant, which is a representation of all that living system. Yeah, all the different trees. I mean, it, it would be really interesting in a kind of, food science way to analyze the difference between um, sun-grown conventional yerba mate plantations um, that, I mean, you, you kind of invented the, the shade-grown yerba mate process to, to some extent, is that apart, well, well, in a, we in a, in a con no. <laughs> I mean, I mean in, in going back to it to, to grow commercially in the shade, because at that time, most, most of the plantations were monocultures in the sun. Or, yes, yeah. we, we just paid attention to how, how was it occurring in nature? We just paid attention to nature, you know, and, and just made up, like they say, a good farmer is one that it's, 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 a, it's a good observer. Mm. You, know, you have to observe. And, and are, are there any studies of comparing the, the, the kind of monocultural grown yerba mate and its ingredients with shade grown yerba mate and how, how they differ? Yes. Yes, there, we, we have a lot different studies. I mean, I wouldn't say lots of studies, there's a lot more, um, but we have one of carbon, you know, the carbon stock. Um, it goes from 30 tons a hectare in a sun-grown conventional, you know, Roundup run yerba mate plantation, which is the 90% of how yerba mate is grown, um, to 120, when it's grown in the forest. So 120 tons, that's one indicator. The other one that we did measure that was really interesting too is um, the active ingredients, the, the, the level of each active ingredient, you know, um, on the yarrow mate, it's shade grown cultivation is higher. So take <clears throat> potassium, iron, magnesium, just to mention through chlor chlorophyll, um, caffeine, um, theobromine, some of these active ingredients are higher in the 
shade grown the versus the sun grown. It makes sense, right? Yeah. Is the, the, the sun grown is stressed. Exactly, it's a stressed plant that is under with, with lack of nutrients and all sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, where the shade grown, it's thriving in its, in its environment, you know? So it's all the active, but another interesting one is that when it comes down to airborne contamination, mm -hmm. yes, why? Because the actual shade protects the plant, from the yerba mate plant, from the airborne contaminants mm -hmm. that come from, you know, from China, they cross in seven to 10 days, the Pacific, mm -hmm. and they land in all our crops in, in the Americas, all around the world now, right? There's a lot of airborne contamination in all of our crops because of the pollution, not only local, not yeah. only regional, but even the one that's crossing the Atlantic. Even, micro, even microplastics, I mean, if they find microplastics at the North Pole, then the microplastics are also raining down on the Macha Atlantica, for sure. Exactly. So we, we did, you know, uh, what's called an organic volatile test that measures, you know, hundreds of, of, of active contaminants. Um, um, it's a very sensitive test. And Just very briefly in parentheses, do you know that there is one of the interesting stories? The instrument that makes that analysis possible was invented by James Lovelock. Really? No. He invented, he, he was really a, a a chemist and, a, and an instrument maker um, in, in, at a university in London, when they, they challenged him to, to make this thing called the ele electron capture detector. And it, it is able to measure such minute concentrations in air that with, without that instrument, none of the data would have been generated that was the basis of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Oh, wow. <laughs> also, I mean, just talking in terms of connections. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Also, I, so, so I you didn't see that connection there. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. So, so sorry, I, I interrupted you. Um, you you, would, you no. did those tests. So, so when we did the, all these, you know, samples and, you know, with our team, we have ethnobotanist teams. On, and um, so, so we're looking at different patterns and relationships that um, that would you know all these variables that would determine you know what what influences all these contaminants or active ingredients. Well, when we went to the contaminants, we we clearly saw that as you would go further into the shade grown yerba mate plantations, there would be no contaminants. Mm. Yeah, as you would go towards the sun grown, higher contaminants, right? Yeah. Kind of makes sense because th th they rain down on things, and if you have a close exactly. canopy above you, it rains yeah. down on the plants above. Uh -huh. And what happens with climate change? You know now. So now you have the the conventional crops declining in yields year after year. Obviously, there is droughts. When it rains, it pours with rain, and it's like, like three hundred millimeters in twenty four hours, and you know. It just kills all the flowers and leaves, and <laughs> it's a disaster, right? So it's the the actual yields of conventional crops, are not only of yerba mate, are declining. They're going down. What happens in the, in the shade grown? They don't decline. They stay. They stay. Why? Because they they are more resilient. They, they there is more humidity in the soil. If it rains or, or hail comes, it's protected. There, there's higher resilience. There's yeah. less contaminant. There's less contaminant. Even even at, even even you mentioned John Elkinton with violence at that time. There was also a really good friend of mine from school working together with him, Alejandro Litovsky. I met him uh, in, at Bioneers Europe when I when I helped Kenny and Nina organize the first Bioneers co conference. He was one of the speakers because he had done the report on ecosystems economics at the time. Yeah. Yes, and, and you know, and Alejandro now has the the um, Earth Security, what is it called? Earth Security Network, which analyzes the risk factors 
that investments have all around the world due to climate change, right? And one of the reports he shared with me about coffee was there is going to be a lack of supply in coffee in the years to come due to climate change because coffee depends on a very small window of 10 to 15 days of flowering. No, that's it. If that flower doesn't get pollinized in those 10, you, you don't have your bean, you don't have your seed, you don't have your end product. And due to climate change, you know, rainfall pouring in those days, throws all the flowers to the floor, no more crop, right? Or changes in temperature, changes in, in humidity that the coffee plant needs. So there's a reduction on the yields of coffee. And one of the things he proposed as a solution is where does, how does coffee grow? It grows. It's, just let's go and look at nature. There's, the answers are there. <laughs> it's like, it's not rocket science. So much, so much of what we, what, what we harvest, we could plant in agroforestry systems together with um, trees that we also selectively, regeneratively harvest for, for biomass or for, for biomaterials, for other ingredients that aren't just food plants. Um, and then, I mean, this is, this is starting to happen in, in more and more places. Um, but is it happening fast enough? I mean, I, one thing that struck me when I was looking at some of the past videos is the, the figures around how much of the Mata Atlantica is actually still left of the, of the Atlantic forest. Um, there were different figures from five to seven percent, and I was wondering that that, that then made me wonder: um, Is it beginning to grow again, or is it still declining? The percentage that is still left. It it, it is still it's sort of like stagnant right mm -hmm. there because it's those remnants are in indigenous communities, small agricultural farmers national parks, state parks, and municipal parks. That's it. Yes? If you look at that 5%, those are the stakeholders that are living in these remnants, and they're holding that 5%. But there's another issue, right? If that ecosystem depends on the rainfall produced by the Amazon, and the Amazon is being cut, then this is going to yeah. all be converted into the reforestation uh, won't happen um, like won't help. Yes, the plants start changing. You you start to have more you know um, drought resistant plants that then overtake that that ecosystem. So the that's what Carlos Nobre refers to is if we if we kill the Amazon. There's going to be a complete change in all the ecosystems in that, South America. I mean, that in many ways, like I was just today um, looking at the WWF's um, 2020 uh, Living Planet report, and and on the one hand, it shows one striking thing, which is that even now we can already see that that we're having less impact because we slowed down because of the pandemic. Um, same as as um, I don't know if you've saw this, but uh, seen this, but the the World Overshoot Day, the uh, Earth Overshoot Day, where where humanity as a whole has used up all the resources that have been generated by Earth in in that year, plus the capacity of the Earth to absorb it, which has been moving since 1970 from uh, December steadily earlier and earlier in the year. And last year, it was on the 28th of July. This year, it was on the 22nd of August. It was the first year in all that time since the 1970s that it made a 23-day jump um, back towards uh, the positive, towards reducing our overshoot. Um, and it's because of the, the, the pandemic. Um, but what, what the report on the negative side shows is that that species losses increasing everywhere. It's in different continents at different rates, and Africa is losing species even faster than anywhere else. Um, 
but of course, along with that and along with climate change, you have a cascade of ecosystems collapses and changes of vegetation patterns of, of things like we were alluding to with the coffee of the pollinators and the pollinated not meeting each other anymore because the, the climate zones change in, in local areas. Even just, you know, in, I was talking to Edward Miller and this is in Costa Rica observable at different altitudes. On the same mountain, you can see how things are changing because the moisture doesn't come up the mountain as far anymore because, because of climate patterns and so on. Um, that means that ultimately, we, more than ever, we're, as we're learning to be custodians and stewards of nature and healing influences in the natural ecosystems we participate in, we're, we're so moving, like working with moving targets because they're constantly changing. And unfortunately, right now they're they're um, changing in the wrong direction. So so it's 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 this. How do we actually decide what to plant and how in one area, when we know that in ten years' time that area will have a very different climate pattern? And and um, so so it's it's the, the whole temporal dimension of adaptive agriculture and anticipatory. Um, regenerative agri agriculture to, to know what will come in 10 years time with climate change and anticipate by what you plan. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's, you know, and, and adding the fires, right? So into it, into the equation and, you know, all of a sudden you, know, you have tremendous amount of fires and occurring as well. And, Close areas where we are, you know, have the shade grown yerba mate. I mean, the fires are very close. So, you know, we we actually train. We have a training program for all our communities to with, with the fire departments and and you know making these barriers, you know, to 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 sustain from the fire from you know moving into these these last remnants of of Atlantic forests, if you may, right. So, um, I, I mean, there, there is a lot of uncertainties, mm -hmm. right? And I think that um, we don't have all the answers. And that, I don't think it's one answer either. Um, I think, uh, interesting enough, even, even when you grow in a permaculture plot crops, um, you, can, you can imitate the forest in those lettuce, and um, um, and um, eggplants and bananas and you, you can you can create a, the same succession, the same dynamic succession that occurs in the forest. You can imitate in a garden, and you can create a a micro ecosystem there, right? That that brings back, you know, the, the different crops at different timing, and producing it at different seasons that allow for the life cycle of life to sustain it. I mean, As you said in the beginning, diversity is the currency. Um, the, 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 here in Mallorca, for example, um, traditionally there were 47 or 48 different types of almond trees that people um, grew around the island because each one of them um, flowers at slightly different times of the year and as you, as you said like weather is unpredictable so sometimes if uh, the early flowering ones sometimes get lucky because it's a sunny sunny period and, and the bees are out sometimes they don't get lucky at all because the bees are still asleep because the temperature is too low and the and the bees come out the week after the early flowering almonds have basically not been been um, pollinated and it so so it is it's the the tendency to towards monoculture that made the um, system so brittle. And if we have more diversity, like luckily we have a, a few here on Mallorca, we have a few um, kind of passionate people that like there's one guy who's got 200 and some species of fig trees that he's collected himself from all around the Mediterranean basis, uh, basin. And in just as one fin finger, the, there's that the highest diversity of fig trees anywhere in the world. Uh -huh. And it's those kind of projects that are actually the the, the seed banks and the the, the archinoas of the of the future um, that enable will enable us to respond to to climate change if we if we pay attention to that diversity. Uh, exactly. 
I mean, I was, I was, you know, that that currency concept of, of you know, diversity being the, the, the present currency was coined by, by Tom Newmark, a really close friend of, of mine and of Guayaquil um, recently, because he, he was in, in Luna, Luna Nueva in his finca in, in Costa Rica called Luna Nueva that, um, you know, he, he told the story that, you know, he started doing organic farming and then, you know, he realized that it wasn't enough. And then he started, you know, doing biodynamic farming. And he also noticed that that, that increased a lot, but still, you know, he was in, in, in this lineal, you know, plots. It wasn't until he started imitating the forest, you know, and creating a, this succession, dynamic succession of crops, grown crops, not in a linear way anymore, that it is just started thriving. And that's why he called it Luna Nueva. Like, okay, I have to pay attention to, to a lot of things here, you know, and, and they're all here and they're all in front of us. And I think that um, the, the pandemic has allowed a lot of people to look at growing food again, reducing waste, even in urban areas, right? And really looking at, at what environment they're, they're living in and what can they do. I am even, I am even putting a, a beehive here in my house in Buenos Aires, you know? And we started doing, you know, our, our own detergents with the orange peels. And we started doing our own vinegar with the apples. And we started doing our kefir drink so we don't you know we don't have plastic one we wonderful project to do with the children as well like it, it when you can do like rather than thinking of these projects as oh i don't have time to play around with this make make it part of the family journey and then it's it's really exciting uh, the... uh, yeah and you know my son is 16 years old and he wants to guess what he wants to go to california and study food science that's sweet which is great but yeah. i want I want them. I did food science, but I had to like go around the block to to come to the to the essence of preparing food again, how it was done, you know, thousands of years ago, fermented foods and you know, not industrializing food as a commodity and preserving it for war times in cans. And it's ridiculous for us to be buying uh, tomatoes in a can. That, that, was, that was the food industry, the food science that developed that in order to consume it in, in war times. I mean, if, if you go to a supermarket, most of the products there are filled with, with packaging and now are industrialized in, in a way to look at the expiration date. They, they last two years, but we actually buy the... Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> right. Brilliant book. It's my Bible for... for <laughs> <laughs> so so I, said, I said to my son, I said, look, you're, you can go and study food science if you want, and, and the whole industrialization of food, but here, you know, you're already a food scientist. At home, he prepares the kefir together with his brother, Seferino, and they do it every three days. And they're the ones in charge of doing the kefir, which is a fermented beverage that feeds our gut with the, with the I call it the flora and fauna, it's not the flora and fauna, but with all the microorganisms that build our immune system and that help us from getting diseases. And, um, and so I think important. that's, that's the way to go. Really. That's, you know, if we all do this Uber, you know, farming in our communities with the crops that we have with the figs in Mallorca, with the potatoes in Chiloé, Chile that have 280 potatoes and varieties, <laughs> 
if you're doing the forest in California, we can, there, there is enough for man's needs, but not enough for man's greed like, like Gandhi, right? I mean, that was one of the principles that made me in school at, at, in food science change my, my paradigm as well, right? It was like, you know, it was a food politics course that I took taught by this Kokumo, by this Nigerian professor that had malaria. He was a wonderful teacher. Like we always have these teachers that change our, our perspectives in, 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 in college. And this, this wonderful professor said, it was, it was, why is there hunger in the world? And there was a question that he never answered, but gave us all the tools to just continue asking ourselves that question. Yeah. Why is there living food the food. when we have enough food to grow everywhere and supply ourselves with enough? But there's not enough for man's greed. And that's where Gandhi's coined that statement by saying, with greed, we're done. <laughs> exactly. That's a that's an excellent place to, to finish. I unfortunately have a call in, in four minutes, so I have to finish. Um, but before before that, just wanted to double check. Are you aware of the project that Christopher Nesbitt is doing in Belize, Maya Mountain Farms? I, I should put you in touch with him and when, when travels are possible again. I, you would love meeting this man. He's he's um doing regenerative agriculture in Belize um, is expert on, on growing diverse ecosystems. He's done a lot of work on chocolate with, with um, kind of green and blacks when they were still a, a very special company. Um, now they've been bought up and done. I would love to meet him. Yeah, and know more about it. I know Belize is one of the pioneers in, in regenerating the, the coral reefs as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's that's another whole, whole story. Tom Garo, you know, and his work on on um, coral reefs. Otherwise, no. I, saw, I I had a conversation with him a while ago. Tom Garo is this um, born in the Caribbean to uh, both parents, marine scientists. Um, he's an atmospheric scientist, marine scientist, whatever, and and he's developed to like he worked with a guy who was doing this for other reasons, but then improved the the, the technology. Basically, he's shown that if you um, put a small metal grid into the ocean, like anchored on the ocean floor, and you replant corals in, in, the, in an area where there's a microcurrent of electricity that you put onto that metal grid underwater, then it's that microcurrent that enables the coral to take energy from that that is used to the, for the basic physiological processes of keeping the coral in the moment, but that energy then is freed up for the coral to grow quicker. So he's demonstrated that by using this very low invasive technique of just putting this metal grid, which eventually dissolves in the ocean, yeah, um, you can regrow coral at four or five times the rate and more than they naturally Re regenerate and, it, and and he's recently done more studies on seagrass meadows which are also carbon sequesters from from the ocean and, and like critically important for ocean health um, and you can also regrow seagrass much faster when you do this I'll, I'll send you the link it's it's fascinating work but unfortunately i have to um finish because the yeah. uh, Okay, um, Daniel, yeah, I have a one o'clock meeting too. I just want to say one more thing. I'm going to send you, I don't know if I sent it to you, but, you know, we, we did an internal just workshop um, with, with um, it, start, it, it, it started off with, with the Earth Charter, um, you know, on, on an Earth Day and what they set up there with, with Frit Capra and Samuel, um, and um, I think it was, it was Marina Silva, well, there was a couple of speakers that were wonderful and talking about the pandemic and everything. And we started off with all of the team in Guayaquil, South America, um, watching that. And then each one just sort of like pointing out, you know, what, what was, you know, identified by, by each individual of these great speakers that were sharing. And 
But anyway, from there, just went into your, your book and we, we applied sort of your principle of, you know, of the, of the symbol of the infinite symbol with, with the four elements. But with, yeah, with, with, the, with the, that curve, that life cycle curve of where, you know, we're faced with death and rebirth and reorganization and regrowth. And we, we used, we have used that as our principle now in Guayaquil in, in South America to recognize, and even in North America too, to recognize that we need to allow this cycle, this dynamic cycle to flow. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know that I have a presentation that it's documented very nicely and in English that I would love to share with you because it is something that you can also share of how your theories and your experience in your book and everything is being applied also in the, in, in the business. Wow, thanks for that. I mean, it's, it's not my, it, the adaptive cycle is kind of distilled wisdom of 40 years of the people in the Resilience Alliance, which are ecosystems resilience people, Buzz Holling and, and those kind of Gunderson and so on, those ecosystem scientists looking at change patterns and evolution patterns in ecosystems and what, what basically how ecosystems function. And, and that's what, when they distilled that, they, they came to the adaptive cycle and the panarchy, that, that these adaptive cycles are nested through spatial temporal scale linking. And, and so basically it, it just perfectly fits for a company that, that is aligned with natural patterns and driven as nature for nature. To, to align with those patterns. Really excited. It was perfect. It was, it was fantastic. It was Wonderful. So thank nice you. Speak, and let's catch up again soon on off recording. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.